Hello everyone, this is my story. Today, people might know me as an innovative and inspirational technologist who creates award-winning websites and digital campaigns that drive social change. Here's a photo of me. Oh, oh. Uh, you might wonder, there's a photo of me with Mark Zuckerberg and friends at a Facebook party at South by Southwest. You might wonder what it's like to be the only black woman in a room full of the world's top techies. You might think that I was born a black nerd or blurred, as we're now being called in the media. There it is. The truth is that I was once this kid, just another struggling minority scholarship student hoping to find a job someday that would pay for my fancy Ivy League education. When I first moved into my dorm room at Yale, I told my mother, that we'd have to find a way to get me a computer. Otherwise, I just wouldn't be able to compete with the other kids. My mom was a teacher. My father was dead. We didn't really have money lying around. I found a program that allowed me to buy a Mac from the school store and attach it to, yes, to my student loans. I made all the arrangements, but when the day came to get my new computer, I was scared, terrified. I'd never owned anything that cost so much. So I dragged along my boyfriend from the seventh grade, Michael, on the pretense that it might be heavy. But truly, I was just scared of the dang thing. Then I made him sit on my bed while I set it up. I think I was just afraid I'd break it or blow it up or just screw up somehow. Michael was very supportive in the way that only someone who's known you since you were 13 can be. Setting up that Mac SE gave me a big boost of confidence. I felt good that I was able to get it working without too much drama. What really changed my life, however, was this woman, Margaret Krebs. You see, as part of my scholarship package at Yale, I had to have a school job, and I was super broke. The highest paying job on campus was washing dishes in the kitchen. I hate washing dishes, <laughs> and I figured I wouldn't learn much that way. The next highest paying job was a computer assistant helping students in the library and dorm computer labs. So that's what I went for. And that's where I met Margaret. I'm pretty sure I was the first black kid to ever apply for this job. I convinced Margaret that I was a fast learner and that I liked helping other people. So she gave me the job. The first computer assistant meeting was pretty interesting. It was straight out of Big Bang Theory. <laughs> out of 30 or so kids, there were only four women. And for three years, only one black person, me. I don't know why I didn't just turn and run that first day. I think it was because in a room full of misfits, I wasn't alone. And in fact, my fellow computer assistants, who were the geekiest kids <laughs> on campus you can imagine, were pretty welcoming, although very curious about me. They invested in training me and gave me the confidence that I could learn what I needed to know. And after a few stumbles, I actually came to enjoy it. I never experienced racism from my fellow computer assistants, although sometimes I did from the very people asking for my help with the, their printer or their floppy disk. After I graduated, I saw the opening in the market. There were a lot of jobs for folks with computer skills. So I steered my career in a direction that would eventually unite my love, new love of gear and gadgets with my passion for connecting people and creating new ways for their voices to be heard. I've worked with some of the most amazing people on the planet. And this was all because Margaret and my fellow computer assistants looked at me and saw someone who could. From around the time I was struggling to figure out how to use a mouse, through the past few years, there's been a lot of talk about minorities and concern that they are lagging behind in their usage of the internet and computers. This is in part because broadband landlines have been slow to reach minority neighborhoods. Dire predictions arose around the supposed effects of this digital divide, which fortunately have not come true. This iteration of the digital divide is dead. How did it die? First, cell phones became cheaper and therefore more accessible. Then, these same cell phones allowed for internet access. So you had large groups of people who became really good at using the internet on their mobile phones. The phones just kept getting smarter. The mobile internet kept getting faster. Today, whites are the ones who lag behind all other groups in their use of advanced internet, smartphones, and social media. 
Pew Internet has shown that 28% of black people use Twitter and 13% use it every day. Hispanics are not far behind. Those numbers are two to three times the rate of white use of Twitter. Women have also taken big strides and now dominate social media. Comscore says that women are the majority of social networking users and spend 30% more time on these sites than men. According to Nielsen, mobile social network usage is 55% female. This shift in influence in favor of women is, has been tremendous. One example is a new social network called Pinterest, whose user base is about 80% women and whose Facebook page fans are 97% female. Pinterest referral traffic is already approaching levels of Twitter and Facebook. So what? You may be thinking, that's great for black people and Latinos <laughs> and Asian Americans and Native Americans <laughs> and chicks. You know, what's in it for me? What do I have to give up in order to create this bright new future for everyone else? I hear you. I work with a lot of white people. <laughs> I've worked for some white guys, and some white guys have worked for me. I've even dated some white guys. I'm sympathetic to your plight. <laughs> After all, in 2011, over 50% of the kids born in America were not white. 30 years from now, whites will be the minority. It will be soon in your lifetime for most of the folks hearing this, or at least in your kids' lifetime. As a lifelong card-carrying member of a minority, I've got some advice that can help you make the most of these shifting demographic seas. <laughs> it's time to get down with the brown, <laughs> to get jiggy with the jiggly. Jiggly parts, I mean, such as women like me tend to have. Right now, we have a situation where resources are not efficiently finding the best investments because of false assumptions, lack of information, and straight up bigotry. In a conference full of other venture capitalists, John Doerr said, when you look at all the world's greatest entrepreneurs, quote, they all seem to be white male nerds who have dropped out of Harvard or Stanford, and they have absolutely no social life. So when I see that pattern coming in, which was true of Google, it was very easy to decide to invest, unquote. Well, I'll be generous and say perhaps Doerr is unaware of the man for whom the term the real McCoy was coined. There was a time when railroads built this great country. A man named Elijah McCoy invented an innovation that helped trains run faster with less need for maintenance and thus more profitably. Railroad executives wanted to know if the locomotives they were running were using the real McCoy, not a cheap knockoff. Elijah McCoy was the son of slaves and happened to be black. Yet even though we still use his innovation, his invention today in trains, the real McCoy struggled to find capital investment for his groundbreaking invention that changed a nation. 150 years later, not much has changed. Silicon Valley likes to think of itself as a meritocracy, a racism-free zone. And that's the right spirit to have. I've personally benefited from that way of thinking. I've also seen the results of a failure to acknowledge bias and the skewing impact it's having in investment and the distortions it's creating in the marketplace. The old digital divide is dead. We now face a new digital divide, a lack of training and a lack of skilled workers, not a lack of ability or lack of jobs. There's a lack of investment and in content consciously aimed at women and minorities. So let's break that down. Out of the entire city of San Francisco, 15 black kids took calculus last year and only 25 in Oakland. Not impressive. This is just one example of the type of education kids need to prepare for a career in technology that they're just not getting. Right now, today, we have people across the country who need jobs, yet good jobs in technology are going unfilled. Unfilled vacancies at tech recruiting firms in Silicon Valley have tripled in the last year. The shortage is causing instability and salary inflation. Our work is slowed down when we can't find qualified, trained, or even interested people. In addition, the people using the services of tomorrow are not represented in companies creating products for them today. Un ultimately, that has to impact the quality of the product. Companies continue to create software, apps, and interfaces with the assumption that their audience is primarily white males. 
Any marketing pro will tell you, you have to know your audience. I recently played a video game that had only two choices of female avatars, a young white woman and a younger white woman. <laughs> Not exactly a game I buy or recommend. According to a study from Kauffman Foundation, only four to nine percent of venture capital has gone to women entrepreneurs. So according to my friend Rachel Payne, who leads global alliances at Google, if you're a woman who has been successful in this business, like me, you have bootstrapped, dodged, darted, borrowed, begged, and ultimately innovated past anyone's wildest imagination. Oops. As Dave McClure of 500 Startups has said, that means if a tech company is not headed by a white male college nerd dropout, it's probably undervalued. It's a really good deal. So what's in it for you? Money, opportunity, and power. It's time to recognize that the person who is clicking like in Facebook or just reblogged a video in Tumblr or uploaded a photo to Instagram or retweeted it on their cell phone is more likely to be black or brown. Those are the companies that will succeed and make the most money in the future. While I may stand out in a crowd of geeks now, this will change with or without your help. Nor will it make this country stronger and more prosperous if we are solely reliant on importing talent from countries that frankly have better educational systems than ours. Josh Mailman and Drew Bernard didn't invest angel funding in my new software product called Attentively because they feel sorry for me. My clients like One Campaign or Moms Rising or Earth Justice didn't hire me because they feel sorry for me. My staff didn't come to choose to work with me because they feel sorry for me. They saw the results I've been able to create helping amazing organizations touch millions of lives. They looked past my race and gender and saw someone with whom they could do good while doing good. How do you get in on this action? If you own a big tech company, consider setting up free or low cost training in computer programming, robotics, or basic engineering at a school in a poor or mostly minority neighborhood. Think of these as fertile recruiting grounds where you can cherry pick among overlooked talent willing to work harder and more cheaply than you might imagine. If you're a teacher, consider infusing more tech talk, no matter the subject you teach. Inspire your students to, con to see themselves succeeding in the world of technology. If you're a parent, let your kids play video games. Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, recently said that all the female technologists she knows played video games as kids. When I heard that, I could only think back to the many hours I spent playing Pac-Man and Frogger <laughs> with my brother on our Atari 800. <laughs> He's a pilot today. Both of us landed in careers that require comfort with tech. He has to run training simulations all the time. He says, it's a lot like a video game. If you're a leader or a lawmaker, advocate for more job training. Let's invest more in our education system. Inner city schools can be places where you find not only the best football players and rappers, but also where the next best technological geniuses come from. If you're a venture capitalist, consider adding some companies to your portfolio that show diversity. That's not affirmative action, and it's not a handout. Diversifying your investments is just smart investing. Anyone will tell you that. Open your mind. <laughs> Anyone can be a geek. We come in all shapes, all colors, and all sizes, even blurs like me. Open your wallet. It takes money to make money. And now is the time to invest with imagination. Information is the new oil, it's the new railroad. Open your heart. Margaret Krebs touched millions of lives through changing one person's life, mine. True power comes from nurturing new power. We have the power to shape the future and to decimate the new digital divide. You have the power to determine your role in a new era. Not only can we bury racism and sexism, but set the stage for a stronger, more prosperous future for, ourse for ourselves and for our country. Now that's what's up. Thank you very much.